um, falling in autism and falling in love, particularly, I wanted to talk about. I know that you're um, consulting on on yeah. um, love on the spectrum. Did you consult on the, on the love on the spectrum on Netflix in the U.S. or the U.K.? Uh, so, yeah. So love on the spectrum. We so 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 far they've had and this is our book Autism and Falling in Love. Uh, check it out; it's on Amazon. Uh, love on the Spectrum had two seasons in Australia, and mm-hmm. I love those seasons uh, because I re- wrote a book about dating on the autism spectrum with helpful tips to help autistic adults and neurodiverse individuals find love and relationships mm-hmm. in a neurodiverse world, and. I fell in love with that series, especially when it went on Netflix. And I stayed in contact with them because I I was already on the speaker circuit talking about relationships, already talking about these topics. Mm -hmm. And we just kind of connected and one thing led to another and they asked me. So Mm -hmm. we continued to dialogue for a few weeks after that. And then they were like, hey, do you want to give an autism training to our team before we have our first US season of Love on the Spectrum? So I got opportunity to give an autism uh, inclusion training to their staff based on my journey growing up on the spectrum and then consulting on the full first U.S. season when it came out on May 18th of uh, 2022. And uh, yeah, it's been great. And we're, we just got renewed for a second season. So that's really Yay! exciting. So I'm hoping we get to keep it up because uh, it's it, it, it's just a great show. Hard for me to pick a favorite because I feel like they're all so lovable and they're so genuine and so themselves and and this is like what i speak about i speak about inclusion and also representation right these people are on the autism spectrum but not only that but then you are a person with autism that's also consulting on the show in different in different avenues to make sure that it's authentic and that is representative of the population no, that makes perfect sense. And and that's why I like do, doing peer mentoring, because I never had that role model to look up to when, when I was a kid who was on the spectrum. I mean, like I looked up towards other people with disabilities, like Michael Jordan, who had ADD, Magic Johnson, who had ADHD. But in terms of autism, there was really never a connection I had where I was like, gee, I could look up to this person. So, Mm -hmm. and now in my career, I'm 34 now, getting the opportunity to work with, especially 16 to 24 year olds in that transition to adulthood and give them somebody to look up to, but just be like, hey, I'm here, I'm here for you. Like, let's talk what's going on in your life, whether it's post-secondary employment, girls, boys. It's it's, it's (laughs) something I hope that I can continue to, to do because those those questions are tough. And it's, um, I, I've been through all of that. So I, I hope I can help them. <laughs> what are some tips that you would give parents of neurodiverse children? So I know one of them is letting them know about their diagnosis early on. So what other things would you offer for the parents that are listening? Uh, especially if they're school age, definitely see about uh, talking to the school district about getting them a peer mentor. Uh, I, I think at, at the same time, we talked about self-advocacy, peer mentorships can really be pivotal for all individuals, regardless if they're neurodiverse or not, but especially those who may be neurodiverse. Uh, I, I kind of reflect and think back as a five-year-old child who was only speaking a few words, how wonderful it would have been to have a six-year-old or seven-year-old mentor who maybe not not had autism but had a neurodiverse uh, ability be able to interact with them and learn from them how amazing that would have been towards my development especially as somebody who had emotional challenges but also had some immaturity challenges as well being Mm -hmm. able to kind of look up to somebody who's a little bit more mature than me uh, is, is something I, I think all of us could utilize, not even in school, but uh, in, in our uh, professions today as adults. Yeah. Uh, so that's definitely one big one. Um, don't try to re- recreate the wheel when it comes to therapies. I see a lot of parents who go right away to speech 
occupational and physical therapy as their main three therapies to help some, some child. Uh, make sure that you are meeting your child where they are in their development. Can't stress that enough because sometimes you, you will see the popularity of those therapies. You also might look at applied behavioral analysis. It's not going to work for every single neurodiverse child. So really meet them where they are. And then when you actually have a conversation with your child's pediatrician, don't stop at their one opinion. Get a second opinion from a school psychologist because you want to have multiple perspectives. It takes a village. That expert could be Temple Grandin for all we know. But at the same time, get those two, three perspectives because that will help broaden the scope. But because you'll get more eyeballs seeing your child and being able to understand more of the things that they may have missed, that one expert may have missed. So that's a really important uh, note as well. I think those are the uh, are, are the, the big three for me. Um, and, and, and there's so much that, that I could share. It's, it, it is a spectrum. Um, that's why I love speaking, <laughs> being able to get to share multiple uh, perspectives.